All right, why don't we get started uh, here? Um, welcome, everyone, to the Budget Subcommittee hearing on career technical education as well as on adult education. Today, we will hear the governor's 2014 2015 budget proposal to fold two career technical categorical programs, uh, specialized secondary programs, and agricultural education incentive grants into the local, uh, local control funding formula. Uh, I uh, appreciate the strong interest in the subject, and I want to give a special welcome to uh, Assemblymember Rudy Salas and Assemblymember Adam Gray, uh, who are here to address uh, this issue. I also appreciate uh, uh, and welcome the students who are here today uh, to uh, address this issue. Following this issue, the subcommittee will have a conversation regarding the various career technical education programs that currently exist and how the state can further encourage regional collaborations among California's high schools, community colleges, and industry leaders in developing career technical education. Specifically, of great concern to me is the fate of the Regional Occupation Centers and Programs, or ROCPs. I've heard from many ROCPs throughout the state, including the Southern California Regional Occupation Center in my own district, that these programs are at risk of having to close down once the maintenance of effort expires in 2014-2015. ROCPs have served as a model for providing regionally focused career technical education for over 40 years. This program is not just like any other categorical program, but it is a regional delivery system that serves the needs of all students as well as our workforce. As a former school board member, I support local control through the uh, LCFF. However, when it comes to state and regional industry priorities, I believe the state is in the best position to make these decisions. These are vital programs for the state's economy and workforce and should not be left to the discretion of school districts at the risk of losing these valuable career technical education programs that the state and our taxpayers have invested in for decades. I am pleased to have local representatives from various career technical education programs at both the high school and community college levels to share their perspective on this important issue. Uh, in addition to these issues, we will be hearing an update on the Career Pathways Trust uh, and the adult education planning process uh, created by the 2013-2014 budget. Thank you very much, and we will begin our hearing. Uh, let's start with the roll call. Mr. Marasucci? Here. Chavez? Tababne? Ms. Dande? Here. Ting? Here. All right, I'd like to uh, invite uh, to the podium uh, representatives from the Department of Finance, the Legislative Analyst's Office, and the Department of Education. All right, I'd like to uh, start off by uh, asking uh, uh, the Department of Finance to present uh, their proposals for the specialized secondary, se specialized secondary programs and the agricultural education incentive grants. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Ed Hansen, Department of Finance. Uh, the Budget Act of 2013 was, is the first year of implementation of the local control funding formula. Uh, the funding, the model is based on uh, providing resources based on student needs. Uh, it also eliminates the historical revenue limit funding model, as well as consolidating categorical programs into the LCFF. Uh, the principal point behind the LCFF is to provide greater flexibility to local districts to be able to use their resources based on local needs and priorities. It also eliminates uh, the restrictions and administrative burden that was placed on 
of categorical programs. Uh, also, as part of the LCFF, districts will receive the same amount of categorical funding that they received in the prior year. Uh, therefore, districts receive the same amount of money. It's just in their LCF, LCFF base or floor, as it's referred to. Uh, consistent with the LCFF, the governor's budget proposes to consolidate the specialized secondary program and the agricultural career technical education program into the local control funding formula. Uh, we believe this is consistent with the overall thrust of the LCFF to consolidate categorical programs into the LCFF and to provide districts with the flexibility to use that funding based on local needs and priorities. Consistent with how the overall LCFF was, is, was implemented in the current year, our proposal would uh, hold harmless those districts that are receiving the, the specialized secondary program funding and ag CTE program in the current year. Their, uh, their base or their floor LCFF in the budget year would be adjusted to ensure that they receive the same amount of funding. Uh, we think that this, would, this approach provides districts with a greater flexibility to use the funding based on local needs and priorities. Uh, the, sec the second, the uh, second, excuse me, specialized secondary program is effect is a is an innovative program that provides districts uh, flexibility to use the funding for innovative programs. This and it is effectively similar to the LCFF in that it's uh, flexible funding that can be used based on local needs and priorities. Uh, Ag CTE program the funding is limited to non-salary expenditures. It's primarily used for equipment costs or supplies. Uh, districts are already providing a significant amount, of money, significant amount of money for this program in the, in the form of salary costs uh, for most programs. That's the primary cost of most programs. Uh, we think districts would continue to, uh, if it's a successful program, we believe the districts will continue to provide those programs. Uh, also as part of the LCFF, districts have to develop an LCAP local control accountability plan within the plan districts need to identify career technical education efforts and to be able to monitor that and make sure that uh, schools are meeting those needs and that students are progressing and monitoring outcomes for students in CTE programs. Overall, we believe that districts are important. We believe that districts will continue to provide these programs where, it, where they are effective at the local area and we think that uh, Districts can also would have the flexibility to possibly modify the program a little bit and improve the program a little bit instead of being limited to state restrictions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'd like to uh, uh, welcome uh, the Legislative Analyst Office. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, Natasha Collins, LAO, and I believe the sergeant has distributed a handout. Okay. So if you turn to page one, you'll see we provide a K-12 funding system background. As you know, and as the Department of Finance mentioned, historically schools have been funded uh, through general purpose monies and dozens of categorical programs. Uh, over time, there was a broad consensus that the categorical system had major shortcomings. Uh, for example, districts were receiving notably different per pupil funds based on historical reasons, whether or not they applied to a categorical program decades ago, and whether or not that region maybe prioritized that specific state priority. Um, in light of these criticisms and others, last year, uh, the state and legislature decided to adopt the local control funding formula, um, which as the department mentioned, rolled the categorical funding into one um, new funding formula that uh, was based on student needs and provided a more rational funding system for the state. On page two, we provide a background of K-12 accountability. Uh, traditionally, the state has held high schools accountable to, st to student performance through the Academic Performance Index, or API. Um, and recently, the state has begun the process of modifying the API to include career and college readiness indicators. This needs to be modified by the 2015-16 school year. Moreover, the state is in the process um, of developing, or rather districts are in the process of developing their local control accountability plans, or LCAPs, and these need to be ready um, by this year, by the 14-15 school year. 
In fact, some districts have already um, sent out drafts of their LCAPs, LAUSD is one example. And in this LCAP, there not only needs to be this modified API, but there also needs to be accountability for career readiness, or CTE. On page three, we provide an overview of the specialized secondary programs, which are one of the programs that the governor um, proposes to roll into the LCFF funding formula. Uh, SSP, Specialized Secondary Programs, are unique because they consist of two distinct parts. The first part, which is 70% of the funding, is a limited term competitive grant that's awarded in four-year cycles. This grant is seen as seed money in order for schools to develop innovative curricula. The other part of the grant is base funding for two high schools, um, one operated by the Los Angeles County Office of Education and one operated by the Long Beach Unified School District. Since the early 90s, these two schools have been splitting $1.5 million on top of their uh, state funding. This money is used primarily to pay teachers, which under statute need not be credentialed. On page four, we provide an overview of the agricultural education grants. Um, 303 grants were awarded in 2013-14. The average grant was $13,500. These funds, as the department mentioned, uh, are usually used for equipment and supplies, and these funds may not cover costs associated with staff compensation or teachers. Uh, this grant is not competitive, meaning that it is awarded to all uh, qualified applicants. If a school is running a state-approved agriculture program, they are able to access these funds. Um, they're evaluated annually on several quality indicators, including staffing, leadership development, and career guidance. It should be noted that the SSP and uh, the agriculture education grants are on top of the LCFF funding that schools receive. So in essence, they are receiving these funds um, above what they would otherwise receive. On page five, we provide an overview of the governor's proposal. I think they explained it very well. Um, they mentioned that they would add SSP and agricultural education grants to the LCFF moving forward, and these, gr these funds would no longer be on top of the LCFF monies that these districts receive. Districts could choose to use these funds as they do now or uh, use them in other ways to target their students' needs. Another part of the governor's 2014-15 um, uh, proposal, which is not directly aligned with SSP and agricultural education grants, is the increase in funding for LCFF this year. The governor provi provides uh, or proposes to provide 11% more in LCFF funding this year or about $700 for, per student. If we think about this in terms of the agricultural education grants, students being funded at $7,000 each, uh, the agricultural education grant on average is the same as two students' funding. On page six, we offer the LAO's assessment and recommendations. Uh, we believe that the proposal to add SSP and agriculture education grants to the LCFF is consistent with our state's decision to move towards local flexibility and also does much to um, move the state in the direction that we determined we wanted to move towards last year, which is a more rational funding system that treats similar students similarly based on their characteristics. Um, the SSP competitive grants, as the Department of Finance mentioned, um, serve to enable schools to develop innovative curricula. But we believe that innovative curricula is being developed every day by schools, and uh, there's no reason to have a special set-aside fund for this purpose. The SSP-funded high schools run in direct cross-purposes to the LCFF, which is to create similar funding for similar students. Students at these two schools have received $12,000 more per pupil year after year. 1,200, I'm sorry, 1,200. Thank you, Paul. Um, the agriculture education grants are used primarily for equipment. Schools buy equipment for all sort, for other um, CTE uh, classes or core curricula subjects. 
Um, it's unclear why there's a set-aside fund only for this one industry sector, for agriculture. Although agriculture is an, a very important part of the California economy, uh, other CTE sectors are also very important, including manufacturing, tourism. We also lead the country in this and other industry sectors. With this in mind, we recommend the legislature approve the governor's proposal. Um, we also recommend holding schools more accountable to CTE student outcomes, which we believe um, is happening through the new API measures and through the LCAPs districts must adopt by the 2014-15 school year. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next, we'd like to uh, invite uh, Monique Ramos from the Department of Education. Good morning. Uh, Monique Ramos on behalf of State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tom Torlickson. Um, as has been stated, the agriculture incentive grants can only be spent on equipment, student leadership programs, and professional development. At last count, California had 1,300 such classes being offered in schools. Um, many of those programs meet A through G requirements, and much of that population, up to 75%, is actually going on to post-secondary education. Uh, we have seen a doubling of enrollment in agriculture science classes over the last 30 years. The superintendent does not support rolling in the agriculture incentive grant into the LCFF. Without state standards, LEAs will have the choice to continue operating the agriculture, uh, the, the ag incentive grant, but <clears throat> and they may re reduce programmatic standards. This would create a patchwork throughout the state of different agricultural programs having different meetings. Given that California is leading the country in agriculture, we feel it's important to have a national, a state standard, I'm sorry, as to what agriculture and, um, programs mean in California. As it relates to the state, secondary, state specialized programs, um, as it's been stated, those, those grants are used to develop innovative programs. They have innovated such programs as STEM programs. They created the first linked learning program, the first A to G aligned CTE course, the first partnership academy, academy, and most recently we've seen innovation in drone sciences. The SPI believes it's important to have a program like the state specialized secondary programs to foster innovation at the local level. Um, the superintendent believes that, in fact, uh, a program like this should exist beyond just CTE, but includes CTE. It's in particularly important in this time when districts are backfilling the cuts they've made for several years to provide some flexibility, some flexible dollars just for innovation so that LEAs have the ability to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we go any further, why don't... Uh uh, I ask, uh, I, I know that Rudy, uh, uh, Assemblymember Salas, uh, would like to uh, make a statement. Uh, so if you can join us uh, at the uh, podium. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. You know, I just want to start with a, a statement, um, if I could, and then perhaps have some of the students come up and also just tell their personal stories. I do appreciate the testimony that we've heard already thus far, and I do appreciate uh, Superintendent Torlickson's uh, support as well. And so what I do want to do is just start off uh, by saying that, you know, thank you for allowing me to testify here today in support of restoring the $4.1 million dollars and funding for the Agricultural Education Incentive Grant that services, and I think this should be underscored, that this services nearly every region in the state, that services over 78,000 students. You know, as you all know, Governor Brown removed the funding by transferring the money earmarked for this grant to the local control funding, which we've heard from the Department of Finance and the LAO also touched upon it as well. While I'm an advocate for local control funding, uh, just like I believe some of the committee, committee members are as well, uh, this grant, I would say is not a categorical program and should not be treated as such. You know, there's several factors that distinguish the Ag Incentive Grant as a, such as, you know, it's got a community board, right? And that's comprised of member, business leaders, that's comprised of teachers, that's comprised of instructors. If you look at other categorical programs, they do not have that, 
right? Secondly, uh, the program raises a lot of money on its own. As we know, the $4.1 million is not enough to sustain these programs, so they go out of their way to actually raise the additional funds to keep this program uh, running. The LAO touched upon earlier about the performance and aptitude. That's another part of this. Remember, this is an ag incentive grant, the key word being grant. They have to perform in order to compete to get these these funds. These are all things that make this very distinguishable and that make it different than than any other categorical. Members, as you listen to testimony today by myself, the students and advocates, keep in mind that this is that this grant is not only the state's investment in tomorrow's leaders, but also an ag industry uh, that's number one not only in California, but I would say even across the country. It's no mistake that California leads in agriculture. Uh, California is only one in five regions in the world with the ideal climate to grow the food that feeds America. You know, uh, make no mistake, just because we have the ideal climate doesn't make us leaders. We wouldn't be number one if it wasn't for the hardworking families, students, dedicated farmers, and ranchers who do whatever they can to keep this industry growing. They do it through, throughout droughts, such as we have this year, uh, through floods, whether it's an El Nino year and often at their own expense. And they do it with pride in keeping California the nation's top producer and employer. You've heard the numbers, you've read about them. It's 43 to $46 billion of just our economy in this state alone. That's why I'm here to get today. You know, this program services students throughout the entire state. It gives students an opportunity throughout the entire state. You know, the nominal investment of $4.1 million is pennies on the dollar when you compare it to a 43 to 46 billion dollar industry. You know, that's tax revenue coming back into the state that pays for things like our schools and pays for things like our roads. Without this modest investment, um, hundreds of agricultural programs in our schools could be eliminated throughout the state. There are FFA programs in every region in California. These students are committed to continuing the legacy of California uh, to being number one in, in actually the world. If ag education isn't funded, thousands of students will lose the opportunity to develop the technical and personal skills to grow in, into the strong leaders of tomorrow that our state needs. I can say with confidence that many of our colleagues support this grant and in fact have signed on to letters and co-authored uh, My Assembly Bill 2033. In fact, I have just a sample of some of the, I believe we have 10,000 letters from across the entire state that have already been uh, delivered to the governor. And this is just a sample of them, and I brought these in case any of the committee members would like to look through these. These are all personal stories. And if you guys can see, these are not form letters. These are personal stories from every student, from business leaders, from people in our community talking about what this means, not only to them and their personal lives, but what it means for their communities. This is a program that grows not just crops, and I want us to get out of that. It does not grow just crops. This grows our future leaders. This is an investment into a key sector in California's economy. And with that, I'd like to, I'd like to bring up some of the students so you can hear personally from them as well, if uh, the chair will allow. But, you know, just personally, I visited a lot of these, uh, these schools and these programs. And I can tell you, um, for instance, I talked to a student the other day, and he was from an urban district from uh, Los Angeles started in a new high school and said, you know what, I would have never been exposed to this um, otherwise, but I love this program. And to be quite honest, he was telling me, he was like, quite honestly, because of the shop classes, because we're able to do things with our hands, uh, that's the reason why I continue to come to school. All right. Let me uh, ask, uh, uh, well, first, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Salas, for your, your leadership on this issue. Um, I. Uh, would like to ask you, just for the sake of mm -hmm. uh, the presentation of this uh, agenda item, that you just limit it to one or two students at this time and then give the opportunity for your, the rest of your students because we'd like to get to the questions and discussions on this item. Absolutely. So we'll have a couple students come up and then maybe some of the advisors, if that's okay. Please. Please. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ernest Lopez, and I'm a resident from Corcoran, California, a small rural community in, San, in the San Joaquin Valley located in Kings County. I'm here today to tell you that the Future Farmers of America organization changed my life, and it inspired me to become a resource 
for those who otherwise don't have the resources to help themselves. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm 24 years old. I am fourth generation American with Mexican descent. I come from a family of five consisting of my two parents and two siblings, an older sister and a younger brother. I graduated from Corcoran High School in 2008 and I'm a recent graduate from the University of California, Santa Cruz. In the summer before my freshman year, I truly started to recognize my place in life and how after years of searching, I could finally see what my small town had to offer the state and nation, agriculture. In the summer of 2004, I was invited to take part in a corn project as a part of my high school's FFA department. I was informed I would be working with two continuing FFA members, a high school supervisor, and an agriculture businessman from our prominent J.G. Boswell Agriculture Company. I admit that I was a little apprehensive to take on such a big project, not being involved previously in agriculture, but I was eager to learn, and I had a newfound openness to agriculture and want to learn more about myself. Over the next two years, I was enrolled in agriculture-based classes and was involved in many extracurricular ag events. In doing so, I obtained my green hand and my chapter FFA degrees and developed relationships with my fellow members and ag advisors. My local chapter went above and beyond to provide the basic necessities required to teach students about agriculture, agriculture education. This organization also fostered my leadership skills that gave me the courage to step up and be my chapter reporter my junior year. Stepping beyond the role of the active member and into the role of a chapter officer laid the solid foundation of who I am today. I became more than just a member. I was a part of a managing team that collaboratively learned new skills and developed collective abilities needed to guide the incoming and continuing agriculture students of my town. This organization also gave me the confidence to simultaneously lead my class as the president-elect, which further refined my leadership abilities. With each year came new responsibilities and new challenges to help me mold myself into a leader and brought clarity to the questions of my youthful past of who was I and what did my town have to offer. I found where I belonged and what I was looking for. And my senior year in high school, it was my last chance to shine and show myself what I was truly made of and how far I had come. After a year of intensive leadership roles and experiences, I applied to be my FFA chapter's vice president and simultaneously my high school's associated student body president and God willing I was elected. I found my place where I belonged and where I had searched and so hardly worked for with the help from my family, my community, but most importantly the Future Farmer of America's organization. After receiving my state degree and finishing out my senior year, my fellow officers and I handed the chapter torch to the next generation of leaders and we left for college. And I'm here today to give my support to the Ag Incentive Grant because without this program I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't be standing here asking for the future generations of farmers and agricultural leaders to have the opportunity that I was given. This doesn't just affect our students of today, our students of tomorrow. This affects the entire state of California. And I would just like to give my support and hope that the opportunities that were given to me can still be afforded to the students of tomorrow. Thank you. I see uh, 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 Assembly Member Adam Gray walked in. Uh, uh, Mr. Gray, I'd like to afford you the same courtesy I, I've given to Mr. Salas, uh, if you'd like to make a statement. Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the committee, I just wanted to add my uh, voice and support. I'm a co-author uh, with Assemblymember Salas of this important uh, legislation. And uh, as he stated, uh, agriculture is a major contributor to our state, and this is a very modest uh, investment that we make uh, with such great return. I think, uh, you know, I'm going to keep my comments relatively short because I think what's most important is to hear from these students uh, behind me who are the product of an incredibly successful program. Um, I would encourage uh, the committee, let's not uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, as we have a discussion and debate on education funding. This is, in fact, an incentive program uh, matched by the locals. 
and produces just such great results. It's character building uh, and fabulous young people. So it's important in my district, uh, it's important in California, and I would encourage your support and thank you for the time to speak. Thank you, Mr. Gray, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. Um, how many, could, can we get a, a, a show of hands as to how many people want to testify on this, uh, uh, on this issue? Okay, all right. I'd like to, uh, uh, in the interest of time, ask that you uh, limit your comments to, to about two minutes. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Abby Carlson, and I'm here representing the 450 members of Elk Grove FFA. I am fortunate enough to have grown up on a farm and been around agriculture the majority of my life. I have a herd of 30 dairy goats that consists of morning and night chores. Because of my strong agricultural background, I made the tough decision at age 14 to choose to transfer high schools to go to Elk Grove High School to participate in their amazing ag program. At first, this was an extremely hard decision. It was extremely hard for me to find myself at a new school where I literally knew no one. But over time, I found a home and teachers that believed in me. The biggest thing FFA has taught me is that even is that when every single FFA member puts on their corduroy jacket, we all become united and equal. And the fact that I have a disability is no longer existent. I was born with a deficiency called PFFD, proximal femoral focal deficiency. This basically means I was missing the majority of my femur bone and parts of my knee. It took my parents two weeks to notice my condition, but ever since then, I went to Shriners Hospital when I was 18 months old and had my very first surgery, where they amputated my foot and fused my knee so that I could wear a prosthesis. The reality is, if someone offered me the opportunity to not have a disability, I wouldn't take it. My, bis my disability is the per has made me into the person I am today. FFA has really helped me realize that anything is possible, despite my disability. Last year, I was the chapter vice president, and I am currently the chapter president. I have morphed into an outgoing, knowledgeable, and well-spoken individual because of FFA. As a freshman, FFA has really opened my eyes to agriculture industry and has heavily influenced my career choice. I was able to attend an FFA conference called Sacramento Leadership Experience, where 40 of the top California FFA members got to take on a role as a state senator, which affirmed my career choices. This fall, I will be attending a four-year university to major in ag communications and then attend law school to hopefully someday I will be back here at the Capitol again as an ag lobbyist. There are thousands of kids out there in corduroy jackets just like mine that feel the same way as I do and have had FFA made a huge impact on their lives. This funding provides more than just another class. It's giving kids not only the knowledge to help the ag industry grow, but also help them find a place where they belong. Being from a farm family gave me a background to grow from. Many of my classmates were not so fortunate. These funds have been used to provide a school farm where my classmates raise over 200 livestock and plant projects that would not be possible without these funds. Thank you. Why don't you uh, please wrap up? Oh. Um, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Why don't we take all the, uh, the comments at this time? Go ahead. My name is Grant Vertigal, and I am proudly representing the chapter of Hanford FFA. Uh, our chapter has 1,056 members. Um, before high school, I was the shy, quiet kid at the back of the class, the one who didn't really know what he wanted to do in life and didn't really know who he was. Uh, upon entering into FFA and entering into high school, I found myself. I found a new courage, a knowledge of agriculture. I mean, I grew up around agriculture, but never really understood the impact about it. And I've also learned many valuable skills. I have competed on an array of judging and speaking teams that have helped me develop who I am and find out what I want to do. Before entering high school, I had no clue what I wanted to do in the future. But after my first year, after competing on several of the judging teams, I decided I wanted to become an agronomist. This, help, this program has helped me define who I am and what I want to do. I have earned many valuable skills such as the confidence to be able to go out and play sports and uh, be a part of our, my associated student body. I have also been accepted to three colleges and am constantly trying to improve myself into making myself a better person. And through this program I, have, program, I have been able to do so. I have earned many valuable skills that has helped me secure several jobs and internships in many variety of fields and helped me develop who I am. So I ask you guys today to help keep the agriculture incentive grant and to help secure the future of California. Thank you. 
Good morning. I'm Evie Starch, excuse me, proudly representing the Hanford FFA chapter. Uh, I, uh, when I was in third grade, my parents got divorced and I had the opportunity to grow up excuse me, on my grandparents' 40-acre walnut farm. So I did grow up within uh, production agriculture, however, much like Grant, uh, who just spoke before me, I didn't really understand the purpose that it served until I got to about the high school age and I entered within FFA. Uh, it really gave me a, an idea of what kind of impact uh, California and production agriculture has, uh, not only within our state, but within the world as well. Um, and then along with being with in the FFA, um, because my parents were divorced, my father was not around at all. So it was basically me, my sister, and my mother. Um, I have um, two or three very wonderful uh, ag teachers, along with the other four. Uh, one of them is here today, and he's been very much like a father figure in my life. And without FFA and being able to know him, excuse me, um, I wouldn't have grown quite as much as I did in the past four years. So this is definitely um, a grant to keep within our budget. So thank you. Good morning. My name is Corey Dominguez, and I'm proudly representing Hanford FFA. Um, when I was in middle school, I was bullied quite a bit. And it came to the point where I was cornered in a bathroom and beat up. Uh, when I came into the FFA, I felt very insecure about myself, thinking that it would most likely happen again. But as I got more involved in the FFA, I was able to bring back that confidence level and actually be standing here today speaking in front of this large crowd and on top of it all, being president of one of the largest FFA chapters in the nation. And my parents came from this organization, and I see how they have grown up and become excellent role models. And without this program, I believe that my parents and myself would not be the way they are today. And my parents are very successful, and I, I can't urge you guys enough to keep this within our budget. Like, we need this, and I just I have all the respect for Rudy Salas and for all the people here who are here to support this grant, and I urge you to keep this in our budget. Thank you. My name is Tynan Hernandez from Corcoran FFA. I'm here to um, greatly encourage you in supporting the Ag Incentive Grant. It's a great program that helped me and a lot of my classmates, in all reality, most of my school. Without it, we wouldn't have most of the leadership opportunities that we need in order to be the next leaders of America. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Juan Ramirez and I'm from Corcoran FFA chapter. Um, I would just like to let you guys know that before I was involved in FFA, I had a very little interest in school. Um, once I did get involved, um, I began to get better grades in all my classes. I wanted to go to school more to be involved in uh, my activities and uh, agriculture, and now it gave me a sense of direction and what I want to do in my life. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Eleanor Harlan and I am the chapter president from the Woodland FFA chapter. Um, I stand here before you today as a seventh generation Californian, a third generation FFA member. Uh, my family has been in agriculture since 1850 and for me, being a part of the FFA organization has let me carry on family traditions and find out that I am personally, um, I want to continue a future in agriculture and FFA has really helped me do that. Um, I've competed on livestock judging teams and competed on the parliamentary procedure judging team and it's helped me develop speaking skills and learning how to speak on my feet. And for me, FFA is a really important organization that I want to keep going. And so I urge you to um, consider us in your um, debate about what to do with the funding. So please help us. Thank you. <laughs> 